my goal in the whole project, um, Nehemiah, was not to not to find curse tablets. My goal was a, a boring methodological paper. I was going to publish this from two dump piles, Finkelstein's dump pile at Shiloh in the 1980s, Zeptal's dump pile at Manival in the 1980s. And I was going to publish the findings and juxtapose those with what they had published and say, okay, here's what you published, here's what we found. And he sent not to make them look bad, but just simply to say, we have all been missing much of the evidence in the past. We've got to change our methodology. That was my, my goal. In the process, we uncovered something very interesting. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with Dr. Scott Stripling. He's been married for 40 years. He has four children and five grandchildren. He's excavated at five sites in Israel and Jordan. He's been the director of excavations at Tel Shiloh, that's the ancient Shiloh where the tabernacle stood for hundreds of years. But he's only been doing it since 2017, not for hundreds of years. He's been a <clears> frequent <throat> guest on media documentaries. His PhD is from Veritas International University in Sacramento, California. Shalom, Dr. Stripling. Shalom, Nehemia. Thanks for having me on. So, uh, and I'm just going to call you Scott. Scott, I wanted you to come on today to talk about what may be the most important discovery of the 21st century which is the Mount Eval lead tablet. Although just from the outset, I have to, I'm required to express my skepticism because I haven't read the um, uh, academic peer reviewed uh, journal article. And really from my perspective, more importantly, is I haven't seen the photos uh, of the tomography, which you, hopefully you'll talk about. But so tell us, tell us about this uh, find, uh, why it's important and 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 what maybe we can expect as far as um you know being being revealed to the public in in the coming months and you know who knows how long it is right <laughs> Sure, I'd love to talk about it. Um, first of all, let me say that the reason that I had a press conference in March and discussed this before the academic publication was out is that I had released photos of the outside of the tablet. It's a very small two by two centimeters folded mm -hmm. lead tablet. And um, not knowing that we had letters on the outside at that mm -hmm. point. And so um, those photos, uh, epigraphers began to see them and began to attempt to decipher writing on the outside of the tablet. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by that point, it was clear to me and I had formed a collaborative team that there was indeed writing on the outside. And for that reason, we felt we had to go ahead and uh, sort of stake our claim, if you will, so that uh, someone else didn't steal our publication, what's known as academic piracy. So um, having said that, the article is now in peer review. It's finished. It's 50 pages long. We have 48 letters on the inside. So, you know, there's a lot to write about. We have to dot every I and cross every T. And uh, Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences, which is a highly rated journal, is where I submitted it nine weeks ago, and we are just still in the waiting period. So the name of the journal is Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences. That's correct. And my experience has been that peer review takes one to four months, you know, something like that. We're nine weeks into it right now, so we're just kind of in a waiting pattern. Um, hopefully we'll be able to to reveal more once uh, once we get through that process. Well, I, I, I've had peer-reviewed articles that took two years. Well, um, there you the, go. Pe the peer review itself might have been six months, but then it was like, okay, well, um, you know, there are 40 articles before you, so we're not publishing it this year. You're on a queue now. You're in a list, right? Sure. So, sure. Um, so yeah, that, well, it happened during COVID, so I, I don't, uh, and we're mm -hmm. still at the tail end as far as the academic world is concerned. Uh, they've got a big well, backlog. And COVID impacted us too, because um, I, we discovered the tablet just before, it was December 2019, I left everything in storage in Israel, assuming I'd be back in a few months, mm -hmm. and then of course in March the world turned upside down, so then it was um, about 18 months before I was able to get back into the country and get the tablet to Prague and begin the process. Mm -hmm. I see. So so let's let's back up a little bit for our audience who knows nothing about what we're talking about. What is this lead tablet? What is Mount Eval? And why is this such an important find, potentially? Assu assuming sure. this checks out, which, which I mean, I hope <laughs> it does. But, you know, again, like I said, from the outset, I've got to say, express my skepticism because I haven't, been, I haven't seen it. Um, and, and I guess the reason that we haven't been able to see it is because you're going through this process. 
And like you said, if you publish the images without the journal article, then someone will scoop you. I mean, is that is that yeah. pretty much the that's, reason? That's pretty much it. Okay, um, fair enough. I'll give you a real succinct version. Um, Abram, Abram cut covenant with God, Genesis 12, at a place called Elon More, which is at ancient Shechem. And so the patriarchs have deep ties to Shechem. Joseph's bones are buried there. Jacob's well is there. And Moses in Deuteronomy 11 and 27 had told the Israelites when they gained a foothold in the land to go north and put half the tribes on Mount Gerizim and half the tribes on Mount Ival and pronounce blessings from Gerizim and curses from Ival. They do this at the end of Joshua chapter 8. And verse 30 of Joshua 8 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ival. Adam Zertal, an archaeologist from Haifa University, uh, in 1980, in his survey of the Manasseh Hill Country, found that location, did not have any idea what it was. He wasn't really even aware of the biblical literature. He was a total secularist. Um, he began to uncover the mantle of stones, as he called them, found a structure. Somebody showed him Joshua 8. He inquired further, and to his shock and dismay, he came to believe that indeed this was Joshua's uh, altar. He had two strata, um, a, a Iron Age one strata and an LB2 strata. And so that's it. There's only two choices. So when we start talking about how do you date the tablet, um, you know, I've heard people say ridiculous things. Oh, you know, they don't know. They're, it was out of context where they found it. That's true. It's out of context. So your two choices are Iron 1 and LB2. And either way, that's older. The The writing that is on it is older than any Hebrew that we have, if indeed we're right that it is uh, is ancient Hebrew. So so explain to the audience what LB2, you know, Late Bronze 2 and Iron Age 1 are. What is the significance? I know because I did my undergraduate in archaeology. Um, but let's say the average person doesn't know the connect. How does that tie into the biblical timeline? Right. So we have a raging debate about the chronology of the Exodus and the conquest, the emergence of the Israelite nation. Um, I was a co-author of a Zondervan text last year called Five Views on the Exodus. And in chapter one, I wrote on the early date of the Exodus. And so people can get all my reasoning there. But in a, in a nutshell, I believe that the Exodus from Egypt occurred around 1446 BC, uh, mid 15th century, 18th dynasty, which means that the conquest began around 1406 BC. Others believe that it was in the 13th century BC, others in the 12th century BC, others it was just a cultural memory, and there's all, all kinds of views, of course, that are out there. But my view is the, the early date. So the question is, do we, when we start talking about late bronze uh, too, it's a period from about 1400 to about 1200. And so what we're comfortable in saying right now is that this is an LB2 inscription. Um, one of the members of our collaborative team believes that it's at the end of LB2. Uh, the rest of us believe that it's earlier, at the beginning of LB2, which would then indeed synchronize with, uh, with Joshua. And, and just to put that in perspective, so uh, if you believe what it says in, in the First Kings, that uh, Solomon completed the temple about, I want to say it says 486 years after the Exodus or something like uh, that. In, in the 480th year. So it was after year. 479 okay. years. So, so if and if you put um, Solomon, you know, give or take 950, let's call it uh, somewhere around there, 975, wherever he is, then you get back to sometime in the 1400s BCE. Whereas most scholars, and, and, I, and I guess I have to be careful about saying most scholars, because uh, you have a book about five views in the Exodus. What I was taught at Hebrew University in the 90s, uh, let's be more precise there is that, well, the Israelites actually didn't come into the land of Israel or didn't even show up. They didn't say come to the land of Israel. The claim was that the Israelites were these rejects from the uh, Canaanite cities, you know, the Israel Finkelstein story. And, um, and they, uh, you know, it's kind of like this socialist upheaval, right? It was a class struggle. And they took over the, uh, these Canaanite cities. And, but we can't really speak about Israelites as a people until about 1200 BCE, which is when you have the Merneptah, uh, I believe it's the Merneptah inscription. Um, it's been a while since I've studied this. Um, and it's one of those kind of things we say in Hebrew, Bal kol chacha, against your will, right? They don't even want to admit there ever was an Israel. But once you have an inscription from Egypt, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, 
Although I think there have been some revisionists who said, no, it doesn't say Yisrael, it says Yisrael, Jezreel, right? Yeah, I mean, nobody's always, buying that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't think it, even the 90s anybody bought that. So so by 1200, they have to admit there's such a thing as Israel or people of Israel or tribes of a tribe of Israel. But you're saying there's actually an earlier chronology that could put it back as early as maybe even 1400 BCE. And this inscription you have is either late Bronze II or Iron Age one, which would put it for between 1400 and, and 1000, I guess, right? Um, so, so tell us about, you didn't excavate at Mount Eval. Um, Adam Zertal did. Let, let me let me jump in with this and tell me if, if, if this is correct, because I haven't studied this in a while. Um, so you have the site of Mount Grisim that's uh, identified by the Samaritans. And the uh, I think one of the issues Zertal had was that the um, altar site that you're talking about doesn't face the Samaritan Mount Grisim. It faces a different mountain. And so one of the possibilities uh, that Zertal suggested, if I again, if I remember correctly from a long time ago, is that the Mount Grisim of Joshua is actually the opposite mountain over there. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, but today it's the modern Jewish town of Elon More, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or there's a yeshiva there or something. Help me out here with the geography. It's been a while. Uh, Zertal believed that Mount Gerizim was Mount Kabir. Right. Uh, okay. And I was actually on Mount Kabir less than two months ago helping uh, Shai Bar from Haifa University who succeeded Zertal and is finishing his work um, helping him uh, survey uh, Mount Kabir. So, so Mount, Kabir is to the, Mount Kabir is to the east of, of Mount Eval, whereas uh, Mount Grisim of the Samaritans is to the south of Mount Eval. And so based on the... if Southwest, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, southwest. So so based on the geography, uh, assuming the Samaritans are right of where they say Grisim is, then the altar wouldn't shouldn't be where, where um, Zertal identified it as. Is that, does that sound about right? Um, Not to me it doesn't, no. Oh, so, so tell me how... So explain that to me. In other words, if the Samaritans are right about... Mount Grisim, how can you have um, the altar where Zeratal identified it? Because it's kind of facing the wrong direction, isn't it? Like half the people yeah. need to be facing the altar from Grisim, wherever Grisim is. Um, yeah, nobody agrees with Adam on that, <laughs> on the identification of Mount uh, Kavir. He may have just been, mm -hmm. hyper, you know, we, we entertain a lot of theories when we're trying to okay. understand relationships. So, uh, I'm not aware of any scholar who has embraced his identification. Um, I mean, there probably are. I'm just saying I'm not aware of any. Okay. Um, yeah, the fact that it's uh, it's at a, actually at a site called El Burnat A, which is on the second step on the backside of Mount uh, Ival, um, is no problem for me, nor okay. for most people. Uh, the the altar doesn't have to be exactly where the people are lined up pronouncing curses. In fact, it would okay. be kind of weird if you had this <laughs> open fire in the midst of, you know, all these people while they're doing this ceremony. So why okay. he chose that exact spot, it's hard to say. I mean, we get so many mysteries and anomalies in archaeology. Like mm -hmm. we excavated for 21 years at Kerbet el Bakatir, which I believe is biblical eye. And we had all the great explorers, you know, Robinson and all these guys came, came along, Condor and Kitchener and others came to Kerbet el Bakatir and um, they saw the church on the summit and they said, well, you know, the locals say that this is where I is, but you now they must be totally mistaken. There's nothing here but a church because they never thought it would be down in the saddle down lower because you would expect the, you know, fortress to be on the hill. It wasn't. For some reason, they put it down in the saddle. So sometimes things just happen in antiquity and we don't know why they put something exactly okay. where they put it. So, so you accept the Samaritan identification of Grisim as Grisim, is that in that case? Yeah, that along with okay. everybody okay. else. I don't know anyone who does Okay. Well, I mean, um, okay. But anyway. also think about the, the prepositions yeah. in Hebrew. Go back and look at them. Read yeah. one of my graduate students did her, uh, her thesis on uh, Manival, uh, Abigail Levitt, she was my assistant director on this project. Mm -hmm. And she wrote an excellent thesis that is now published. And she does a really good section on the Hebrew prepositions that you're mm -hmm. actually in Manival, not on Manival. Okay. So you can easily get a copy of her. Uh, her All right. Uh, well, I, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Well, what is her name again? Yeah. Abigail, Abigail Le yeah. Levitt, L E A V I T T. Okay. I will follow She's now up doing on her that. PhD at uh, Ariel University. Okay, very interesting. All right, 
So you didn't excavate at Mount Eval, Zertal did. How is it mm. that you found this tablet uh, <laughs> decades later? That that's that's part of the exciting story to me. Yeah, you know, it is. It's super exciting. So. I had worked for two years as a supervisor on the Temple Mount Sifting Project in Jerusalem, was a big believer in the potential of wet sifting. I'd made up my mind that when I excavated a site that had water, that we were going to wet sift in situ because no one was doing that. Um, what little wet sifting was being done, which was revolutionary, was all out of context material. So what I developed is, is I took that methodology, actually that Starkey had first started working with in the 1930s, and that Barkai and, and Devir uh, developed in re more recent times, what I did is I added to that protocols where we could use it in the field in situ so that we could preserve the stratigraphy mm -hmm. and know exactly where things came from. And we wet sift 100% of the material at Shiloh. So can, like you, for, can you explain for the audience what that means in situ? And, you know, what, what, so what, how is that? And what is wet sifting versus dry sifting versus no sifting? Uh, maybe just like give a little brief explanation of that because that, that's how you ended up finding this thing. It's also how Barkai found this, the silver scrolls, the famous silver scrolls uh, that have the priestly blessing as he was doing some sort of a sifting back in the 80s, right? I don't know that it was wet sifting per se, but um, so, so tell us about that. Um, well, first I'd like to finish my thought, um, mm. <laughs> um, which I have now lost. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> You were talking about how you were doing uh, wet sifting in situ, and you did that for everything yes, okay. as you were excavating. I remember. I have it back yeah. now. Um, yeah. What I was going to say is that uh, for every one scarab that we used to find, we now find five. Wow. For every one bula that we used to find, we now find five. For mm. every one coin we used to find, we now find ten. Um, mm. So this is just shocking. And so I had probed some old dump piles. You may remember Herschel Shanks beating this drum and bar years ago, you know, wet sift the, the dump piles at Megiddo and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I probed some dump piles and I was blown away by what was in them. Mm. And so my idea was because of the Oslo Accords and the, the divisions and so forth, Mount Eval fell within Area B. You had divided jurisdiction and is it grandfathered because it was pre-93? Just a lot, of, a lot of gray areas there. So we clearly could not uh, excavate. But um, we, what we did is we removed the part of the dump pile, about 30%, from his east dump, which is the material from the altar, according to his notes. And we removed it to a nearby site called Shave Shomron. And um, at Shave Shomron, we erected a portable wet sifting station there. And I'll, now I'll define those terms. And uh, so we re-sifted again, we dry sifted once again, the material that they had already dry sifted, just so we could get the soil out of it so we could see things. We did recover quite a bit. And then we took it through the additional protocol of washing it. So the, mm -hmm. the way that works is we have power hoses and we wash the, the tray of material. And when we do, all the dirt comes off, you move it around, give it another rinse. And now we can see what looked to be a little rock may actually be a scarab. Okay, mm -hmm. so this this is why it's so revolutionary because if you're only dry sifting or sieving the material, then and think of a volunteer. They're doing this all day long and they're seeing thousands and thousands of little stones and pebbles and you know the mind sort of gets into a, a loop. But when we wash the material, the colors pop, we can now see lines that we couldn't see before. So for us it's been revolutionary. So my goal in the whole project, um, Nehemiah, was not to not to find curse tablets. My goal was a, a boring methodological paper. I was going to publish this from two dump piles, Finkelstein's dump pile at Shiloh in the 1980s, Zeptal's dump pile at Manival in the 1980s. And I was going to publish the findings and juxtapose those with what they had published and say, okay, here's what you published, here's what we found. And he sent not to make them look bad, but just simply to say, we have all been missing much of the evidence in the past. We've mm -hmm. got to change our methodology. That was my my goal. In mm -hmm. the process, we uncovered something very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I want to just help the audience here uh, exp you know, understand some of these concepts. Look, I, I did an excavation in like 1990-something uh, while I was studying at Hebrew University. And um, I spent an entire... Uh, summer cleaning dirt off of a dirt floor from the Persian period. Um, 
And, and, and it was really this painstaking, meticulous work where at some point you're using like a paintbrush just to dust off dust. But then what you find, when you find interesting things, you put them in this, bu in this bucket and then they, um, maybe they sift the bucket, maybe they just focus on, um, on you know, what you identified and then everything else gets put in a dump pile. And so you end up with literally, you're removing material from the archeological sites and you're dumping it into a dump pile. And what you did is you went back and um, not only dry sifted, which I think maybe is self-explanatory of the dump pile, but then you wet sifted, you washed it down to you know see, okay, what is there? So, so and they were doing this on the, the um, uh, and we've spoken to Tzachi Devira in the past uh, on this program and um, Frankie Snyder. So if my audience goes back, they can see uh, information about, um, about this wet sifting uh, for the Temple Mount um, uh, material. Uh, in that situation, the uh, Waqf, the Islamic religious authorities, had to remove 400 dump trucks full of dirt from the Temple Mount. Who knew what was in there? Uh, Tzachi Devira followed the dump trucks and eventually ended, did this project, and maybe still doing the project, I think, of, of wet sifting it. Um, so you now were applying this to places that had been intentionally excavated by actual archaeologists, not by uh, people with backhoes who were pillaging a site in order to build something. Um, and you find things. And, and so that actually is a really important development, right? Because this method had been applied in a very specific situation where, okay, we have dump trucks full of stuff that wasn't properly excavated. Who even knows what's there? You're talking about stuff that was, was properly excavated. Um, but still, they weren't using this methodology. Yes. And then what I'm saying is at Shiloh, we took it in a step further even. We mm -hmm. are now using it in situ, the material, as we excavate in the square, mm. we then wash it there. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And so, so that we know exactly where it came from. So mm -hmm. when we're finding these, these items, we can then simply, we know exactly what stratum it comes from. And that's why okay. it's so important is it can help us identify our stratigraphy correctly. Right. And then so just to give the audience an idea of, of how important that is. So uh, it used to be, I don't know if that's still the case, but you could go and, and volunteer for a day on the um, uh, Temple Mount Sifting Project. I did that a number of times. It would take groups of people there. And... What you would have is you'd pull out pieces of, um, you know, modern uh, uh, soda bottles alongside coins from the Middle mm -hmm. Ages and pieces of, um, of floor tiles from the Second Temple. And all of those would be in the same tray because it's just this hodgepodge and this mix of stuff. It may have started out as what's called fill, right? Meaning even when it was in, on the site, it could have been all mixed together. But certainly after it's taken out by the dump trucks, it, you know, haphazardly, it's, it's all mixed together. But you're actually doing it where you can say, hey, this is from this specific layer, and this is a clean, uh, pure layer. It's not a mixed layer, which happens too in archaeology. And you could say, okay, here's what we found in this layer. That's, that's really important. So has that been, you said Starkey was doing that back about 100 years ago. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Well, Starkey was a genius, and unfortunately, he was murdered uh, in Damascus Gate, and oh, really? uh, very tragically, and brought his excavation at Lachish to a close. Mm -hmm. uh, we have photos of him using the locals to mm -hmm. wash material through through wicker wow. baskets, and um, um, he was such a genius. And you would think his students and his proteges would have. Uh, kept that methodology, but they didn't because mm -hmm. it's slow and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Ah, <laughs> two words right. archaeologists don't like, okay? Right. So while I have had a number of colleagues who have embraced the new methodology that I'm trying to get everybody to embrace, I've also had a lot of resistance because oh, it's slow and it costs money. And it's frustrating to me because this is not a race. And as archaeologists, we are destroying the evidence in the process of excavating. And so once we've taken something out of context, we've made it inaccessible to others. So that's kind of an ongoing, you know, challenge that, that we're dealing with. So um, Adam Zertal goes and he excavates Mount Eval and he has these, these dump piles. And you go and you want to test those dump piles and you find this lead tablet, tell us about the lead tablet. 
Well, you mentioned Frankie Snyder's name earlier. Mm-hmm. Frankie was yeah. is a member yeah. of my staff, and mm-hmm. so uh, it was in her tray that it was found. So providentially, mm-hmm. our most experienced wet sifting volunteer is the one yeah. whose tray it ended up in. She recognized okay. it, and uh, so there's no question, Nehemia, whether it's a curse tablet. It is a curse tablet, okay? okay? We knew that from the moment that we saw it. Frankie saw it. She called me over. I looked at it. I thought my heart was going to leap out of my chest. I showed it to Abigail. She immediately knew what it was. It'd be like, is that a jawbone? I mean, (laughs) we've seen hundreds of these. We know what curse tablets are. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason this was exciting is because it was from the mountain of the curse, from what we thought was an altar. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. We were agreeing with Zeptal that it was an altar. Um, So hundreds of these have been found uh, in Israel. It's they're always on lead. They're they're folded. They're considered to become binding once that they're folded. And to your skepticism, the very mm-hmm. first words out of my mouth to to Frankie and Abigail yeah. and anyone else who gathered around was, "Guys, don't get your hopes up. We don't. Mm-hmm. We can't prove this is from, you know, the late Bronze Age. You know, all we know that is it's a curse tablet." These are more common in the Hellenistic and Roman period. It could be that a pilgrim from that time, you know, knew this was Joshua's altar and they came in, which still would be very significant. But, um, you know, we, just be careful. Let's let's not get our hopes up too high. But it, mm-hmm. while I'm saying that, of course, I'm thinking in my head that I'm contradicting logic because all Zertal excavated was late bronze two and iron one. Okay. So um, as as it turned out, once we were able to do, do the tomographic scans, I was blown away because um, the very first letter that I saw was a an ox head that was morphing into an aleph, and I, I mean, we know what that script is. It's a what we have called up to this point a proto Canaanite, proto Sinaitic script. You know, we have the the minds that set of El, El Hadim. Um, and these scripts are known. Um, um, you have one recently from Lachish. Uh, so it's mm-hmm. not that it's not a known script. It's that scholars have called it proto-Canaanite mm-hmm. um, when many of us, because the presupposition has been that the Hebrews were illiterate. Moses could not have written. Joshua's, Joshua could not have written. Um, and therefore the Bible is from a much later time period and that there were no eyewitnesses and you can't trust the reliability. That's the narrative. And really the only way that you could tell the difference between Canaanite and Hebrew, because they're using the same alphabet. Like mm. if I have Islamic neighbors, that, <laughs> they speak English, we're, we're using the same alphabet, you know, when we're communicating is do you have words that are uniquely Hebrew or words that are uniquely Canaanite? And you do have some in the religious vernacular. And lo and behold, uh, if we're right, that's what makes this unique. We have the name Yahweh or Yahu twice in the inscription. And there's only one group of people in the ancient world worshiping Yahweh, and those are Israelites. And the three-letter spelling we already have that down in Egypt in the Soleb hieroglyph. That's 14th century, the land of the Shasu of Yahu uh, on the Soleb hieroglyph. So you've already, by the 14th century, got this god, and the earlier spelling is not what we typically think of as the Tetragrammaton. So uh, when we saw that there was script, it was tiny, you know, written with a tiny stylus on the inside. It was folded over. We recovered that through tomography, and we began to attempt to decipher it. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com.